You're joining us today for Gov Insider Live Studios, where we bring you brilliant global innovators from across the world. Today, he ran for Vice President of Indonesia. He was the Vice Governor of Jakarta, and he's an entrepreneur and politician and campaigner as well. Please welcome Pak Sandiaga Uno. Hello, Jaws, and thank you very much for having me. I hope you're in the best of uh, health situations otherwise, and everybody keep uh, in a very good spirit. You were noted for your entrepreneurship program, OK Oche, when you were in Jakarta. How can entrepreneurs and businessmen help the country now as it faces the coronavirus? Well, as you know, Josh, more than 60 million micro, small, medium enterprises have made up 60% of Indonesia's economy. 97% of jobs are created by these micro, small, medium enterprises. So this is if there is any program to resuscitate the Indonesian economy, SMEs and OKOJ would be the ones that the government should be focusing on. Mm. Because small and medium-sized business is the clearly where they are the front line. They have the ability to weather this crisis. If they uh, follow what the government is ordering, they are the job creator. Historically, entrepreneurs have demonstrated strong adversity towards crisis, and this crisis is no different. Now, they are now suffering very, very tough situations because unlike the 97-98 crisis or the 2008-2009 global financial crisis, mm. we have the, uh, a pandemic situation here. The COVID-19 prevented uh, social interaction, so their business is just collapsing. Mm. I hope... Uh, the SMEs will be resilient this time, like many other crises before. And they have been the last man standing, mm. as well as helping people to survive, having their income, their daily income, and so forth. However, this is the first time in a crisis where they have been hit the first, first time. They, they are now suffering. So I'm proposing that the government and the government is hearing a lot of inputs from some of the advoca advocates of the micro, small, medium enterprises. And we believe the package of the financial package is going to be more towards the micro, small, medium enterprises. Hmm. And I, I understand also that you're pushing your fellow entrepreneurs to come together and to provide support for the very poorest in society who are hit by COVID-19 as well. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what that program entails and what you're, you're working on there. Yeah, we are seeing that some of the people affected by the COVID-19 are the people who are in the informal sectors. They have been getting daily wages and they are, because the economy is at a standstill, they're not going to be able to collect their daily income. So I said that, this is the time not just for the government to step in, but for everybody to step in because we are in this together. So we are saying that the larger micro, small, medium enterprises who are in the sectors that is not so badly hurt to also put their hands together and help as much as we can. And the help could be a blood donor or anything that, that will help us to go through this crisis. And the government has their hands full, has their plate full. We have to help in any way we can. Mm. And, and since you put out this call to uh, fellow businessmen to be supporting the poorest, what has been the reaction from them? How have you seen people come together? We have seen tremendous help. Uh, we have like seven programs now running. Uh, the first program deals with the backbone of the family that has been identified or has been uh, receiving the test and they have the COVID-19, we're now putting together a collective fund to help the family to go through the self-isolation phase of 14 days. We'll provide them income as well as basic food and basic necessities on the 14 days. Uh, we have also programmed to support the local businesses mm. that right now they used to have 
steady income from people ordering foods, ordering their services. Now they have to suffer because their demand, aggregate demand is collapsing. So we put together another fund to help put together a special effort to help the small business to continue to be able to supply. And we also have uh, a shortage for the PPE, the protective mm. gears. Mm. It's, it's terrible. Some of the people in the front line have no adequate protective gear. So we put together another fund to help source the protective gears. Some disinfectants for the houses for the personal use to increase personal hygiene, some help also on the increase in immunity, like the vitamins, the herbal supplements. Uh, we are also helping as much as we can. So this is all hands on deck. Uh, all options are on the table. We have not seen anything like this. This is unprecedented and extraordinary situations call for extraordinary measures. I said we put politics or bureaucracy aside, we focus on fighting COVID-19 together. Mm. And the fascinating thing about this is that it's private citizens, it's businesses, it's campaigners such as yourself acting faster than government has been able to do to put these packages together. So first, what does this show about the strength of Indonesian society? And second, now that you've set this up, how can government get involved and, and follow what you've done? Well, the government we don't want to blame the government at this stage because they are under a very extreme pressures. They have to make the right sort of like policy response to deal this three layer of crisis. They have health crisis, they have social crisis, and they have also the economic crisis. Entrepreneurs have some kind of immunity. And the current crisis we face today is truly enormous. So we, we say, okay, government, please make sure you deal with the policy formulations. We have the smaller scale, we have the flexibility, we have the ability to move much quicker. The dimensions globally is humongous. 1.3 million people already uh, basically got COVID-19 and 100, almost 200 countries now. Everybody will be impacted. And because small, medium enterprises, entrepreneurs, pretty much become the social fabric of this nations. we should be able to do in whatever we, we can. So government will play the role in terms of providing the policies for counter-cyclical, making sure that the health facilities are being uh, make sure adhered to. And I think uh, they could also provide some kind of incentive in, some, in terms of tax, uh, fiscal incentives, yeah. SMEs could get some kind of a breathing space on debt restructuring, yeah. uh, on bills to pay, for instance, electricity bills, rental bills. Uh, also, we are seeing that uh, people could get help if, because everybody is using telecommunications and I had some early communications in terms of my Wi-Fi because it's overload. Mm -hmm. uh, small business would need some help also on their communications, give a package of free quota, free bandwidth for the next three months. That would be something that uh, the government would be able to do because they have the small, medium enterprises issues, but they also have state-owned enterprise that is large. And I guess they are in a much better shape now to do these collaborations because, again, I would say that we have to realize that we are all in this together. Social distancing, doesn't mean that uh, we're anti-social. Social distancing means that people have to support other people who are in higher needs, mm. in uh, much dire needs. Mm. And I think I'm seeding some initiative, blood transfusions, I mentioned already char charity auctions. I just auctioned some of my stuff online here from home. And whatever that we got in terms of the Funding, uh, we are pledging to multiply, to double it, uh, to make sure that uh, we could help as much as we can. Because not only policy, but the speed whereby the policy got implemented is key. We need to bring the cash to the pocket of the SMEs. Yeah. We need to bring the much needed help to the people. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think uh, we need to do it. And now is the time. Mm. And of course, you have experience of uh, running 
provincial of local government, in your case, vice governor of Jakarta. Aside from the national government, what can the city and provincial leaders be doing at this stage to be helping their people as well? Well, matter of fact, the provincial government, the district government have a much tougher job because they deal directly with the people. Mm. And the city government of Jakarta is dealing with cases of how they could in conjunctions with the central government, develop this massive test or rapid test capability. We are now basically all in acknowledgement that Indonesia's lower number than predicted may be as a result of the less cap or lack of capabilities in terms of providing massive rapid tests. Mm. Now, you need to make sure that the local government is in sync with what the central government is ordering. And the central government is not deciding to do a lockdown, a strict lockdown, but rather a very disciplined social distancing. Mm. Because the central government knows that on a city by city basis, the case is so different. Jakarta is uh, classified as red zones but maybe Samarang or other cities are different. So this is whereby local wisdom, local leadership will be able to uh, step up to the plate and coordinate with the central government, coordinate with business side, coordinate with their communities in order how to make sure that we fight this COVID-19 effectively together. Mm. The United Nations has just said today that uh, there are countries that are holding back medical supplies. There are medical export bans. They're refusing to share testing uh, and masks and other equipment as well. What can Indonesia do to make sure it's getting these tests and this equipment that is being withheld? This is completely wrong. And it was a knee-jerk reaction. So I think Indonesia also realized that we, we did something to that nature whereby we prevented export from the protective gears uh, industry here that was badly needed in Europe. This is the time not to think only for ourselves. Mm. You have to think outside yourself, think of others. And the global interdependence is now being called, whereby we could have efficiency in terms of productions in some part of the world. We'll need to help other part of the world. So this is where leaders of the world needs to get together, coordinate, make sure that the medical staff, the medical units that respond first in terms of this COVID-19 will get the much needed protective gears that they would need. So secondly, I would strongly use this, this pandemic as a, as a reason for everybody to talk about how we could work together closer in terms of fulfilling what it, whatever it's food or medical supplies or medicines and any kind of help that we need. Because physical distance, you can solve now by digital connections, but whenever it's about food, you need to bring it to the, the customers, to the people. So we see uh, this is a growing, rapid changing situations whereby everybody needs to work closer together, not actually building walls and trying to solve the COVID-19 by themselves. Mm. I am strongly urging government around the world to work together, set up uh, a unit that specialized to communicate in other way how we could help each other in this very tough, difficult situations. Mm. Uh, and you've always championed the use of technology as well, uh, particularly in government. How can governments be using technology now to help ordinary people and to try and battle this crisis? Well, the government, business sectors, the people now is the time to embrace technology. The Industrial Revolution 4.0 is now call in advance. This is a taste of the future. This is a glimpse of 2050, for instance, we need to use technology not only in healthcare, but also in working life and in government. Physical distance, again, now is solved by digital connections. We see rapid growth in digital service usage, and I am calling 
all this telecommunication company digital to increase their bandwidth. It is already happening. Growth will definitely drive interconnections. And this uh, crisis will drive also innovations. And this is still early in the discovery process, but communications, I think, will benefit from this aftermath of COVID-19. Post-COVID-19, I will see payment services is going to increase. Uh, startup company, the unicorn that deals on how people do things, but also how people get things. It's going to collaborate even further. Fulfillment, even in the vaccine era, you need to develop vaccine faster. Cannot wait until early next year, but it has to shorten the time that we could deal with this pandemic because this is not going to be the first one that we're going to face. The last one that we faced was 100 years ago. Today, we may face this in a matter of the next 5, 10, or maybe it become a regular event. So we need to respond better. And this is how I'm calling also to the private sectors to work with government in terms of how we could use technology to develop better vaccine and better medicines for the future. Hmm. We are live now on Facebook Live. Please, in the comments, tell us where you're watching from. Share this to your profile and ask us questions as well as this interview continues. Let's talk about government communication now. What do you think that government could be doing to reassure citizens and also to help uh, communicate the best healthcare policies and other policies as well? First, the government needs to work together. Mm. You cannot just handle this by yourself. So the quadruple helix collaborations, you bring in public, you bring in a uh, member of the communities, you bring in the academic, you bring the the best of the government, put the best resources to deal with this communications, put the resources that are adequate, because if you give succinct, transparent, good fact, good information, it will not only clarify, put clarity in the situations, but also unite the people. We know what to do and it will drive the path towards the solutions. So we need to bring this best of the best of resources to bring the communications better. Indonesia has its issue, it's now improving. We have to scale up, we have to prove up. And I think you need to clear, clearly state it in your communications and be transparent because nobody has experienced doing this. So they need to also put the responsibility to the people also. Open, sincere, clear, and deliver promise. This is away from the political seasons, away from political campaign. Give what is the reality. Help the people to adapt to the new normal. Help the people to, to make sure they facilitate to be working together. Put priority in humanity. Save life first, save economy later. Humanity first. That is what I have been advocating. So the government needs to pretty much focus on this. Don't put the cart before the horse, focus on the human side, save life, make sure the medical staff get all their protective gears and all the facilities are being supplied adequately. Mm. What do you think that some of the big tech companies could be doing? The Facebooks, the WhatsApps, Instagrams, and of course, you know, the other the platforms as well, Twitter, for instance. This makes me excited because uh, now it, all, because all hands are on the table, uh, basically there won't be any more barrier. So everybody needs to collaborate. Mm. The Facebooks, the Instagrams, they are now, uh, and the Zoom, mm. uh, Google Meet, we're in Skype. This is uh, the company that needs to provide all the services, the help that they need because everybody now connected digitally somewhat. So they need to work together to make sure I was on a, Facebook Live yesterday and it dropped because we, uh, not the problem of the Facebook, but the, the local problem that we have with the bandwidth. Mm. So uh, it's a time also for Netflix to pu uh, put up very good content because we are uh, spending more time uh, streaming and uh, the content that makes people uh, be innovative, creative, uh, have a upbeat, upbeat uh, optimism and have good information. These technology companies can help tremendously, significantly 
on a social front to make sure people get the right and trusted information. Hmm. Uh, Indonesia's poorest are, are going to be hit worse by this virus, undoubtedly. And the United Nations has said that many countries in Asia don't have sufficient social safety nets, official social support. Some countries are starting to trial what looks very similar to a universal basic income, where we all receive a salary from the government at the moment. Do you think that's something that Indonesia could introduce? Yes, for the bottom 40%, definitely. This is a really very tough, difficult time. What we call the uh, bottom of the pyramid, uh, I would say the bottom 40%, of our social economic structure will need some kind of help from the government. I know our government is not really having the fiscal flexibility, but this is the time also for the government to reallocate some budgets that were supposed basically to build long-term infrastructures, to move the capital. For instance, this is a time that we need to reallocate those funds to help the people. A universal basic income will help the economy because people have the need to have in, in, in order for them to hold the cash, they, have the, they need to have the income. And once they have the income, they have the cash, they will consume. And once they, cons they consume, the small medium enterprise will, will go up. And this is how you jumpstart the economy. Mm -hmm. So people will have to go through many scenarios planning in terms of the government uh, side, I have been telling the government, bring the cash as fast as possible to the people. Mm. This is going to be a critical time because next month is Ramadan. Mm. It's once in the year whereby people are fasting. Supposed to be their demand drops, but it's actually the other way around. So that's why in order for the government to deliver a much better policy, bring the cash before Ramadan use universal basic income, that's a very good idea. And people will definitely uh, change after this outbreak. They will be more responsible. They will have better savings. They know that the days when they cannot go out from their house for an extended period of time, that they need savings. And this is going to be the so-called rainy days that they have been uh, hearing about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, universal basic income also will teach the government to save all its resources, things that could build, be built by private sectors could be done on a public-private partnership so that all the money that the government can save will be able to be used to bring the cash that the people at the bottom of the pyramid would need. And just to confirm, so you are calling on the government to pause its plans to build the new capital city in East Kalimantan. You think those funds should be reallocated elsewhere? Oh, not only moving the capital, but basically the unnecessary, unessential infrastructure projects. Because we have not seen the full brunt. We are bracing for impact now. The government would need all of the budget that they would have to support the people of Indonesia. We can think about the infrastructures. We can think about the moving of the capital later. Let's not cloud it our discourse, public discourse on non-COVID matter. Mm. Let's be disciplined. Let's put matter with the utmost priority first, which is COVID now. We could have the political discussions later on, but today let's focus on making sure, first and foremost, that we save the people's life. And this is the time for Indonesia to step up and make sure that the leadership understand, deliver the promise to the people that the government is there to protect them. Mm. And I'll just ask you one more question. You ran against President Jokowi in the last elections, but I see in the news recently that he referred to you as the next president of Indonesia. Do you have any plans to be pursuing any leadership roles on a, a local or on a, a national level? This is not the right time, Josh, to talk about something like that. This is going to take uh, bandwidth away from much needed uh, uh, program for the COVID-19. But I would say that uh, we have four years to go for 2024. Let's deal with it uh, much later down the road. 
we need, I need, I want to use this very precious time because it's very hard to get your attentions, uh, the netizens in the world that implement social distancing. We have 16 people arrested yesterday in the south part of Jakarta because they were just hanging around, not getting the awareness and they're not f uh, wearing face masks. We need to have stricter social distancing and protective policy. So uh, all the politicians will need to, for the first time, work together and make sure that not only that we adhere to the social distancing, physical distancing, but also to push the direct transfer, the cash transfer to the people. You, you mentioned universal basic income. I'm totally in agreement that now we need also, other than putting money in the pocket of the people, to make sure the second thing is basic food, basic necessities will be available at stable, affordable price. Mm. We don't want panic buying. I don't want people to hoard uh, all those basic necessities, rice, uh, meat, uh, milk, and so on and so forth. We need also to help families now, communities to cut their costs. I am advocating that for the next three months, state-owned enterprises will give some kind of an incentive or some kind of a discount in terms of electricity bills, mm. water bills, and also for the food staples. Uh, with that, I think it's much, much more important than talking about leadership change more, maybe in 2024. Mm. This is a time whereby we need to focus, make sure that we survive this COVID-19 situation. Mm. Pak Santiago Uno, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Josh, and uh, good luck for the people. Stay safe, stay healthy, and, and stay at home. Thank you. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for joining us, and stay tuned for next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Jakarta time, 4 p.m. Singapore time, where we'll be joined by the Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Come up with your questions now and she'll be keen to answer them then. Thank you very much and see you again soon.